All right, so once again, we'd like to welcome you all to Invasive Plants Near You, part one of our um, multi-series webinar on invasive species. I'm Dr. Katherine Clements. I'm the Ecology and Natural Resources Educator here at University of Florida IFAS Extension in Sarasota County. I grew up in Western New York and spent a lot of my youth out in nature and started my professional career in environmental education before becoming a physician. I returned to environmental education in 2017 when I took this position at University of Florida IFAS Extension where I am the Ecology and Natural Resources Educator. I spend my days um, educating about wildlife and our Florida ecosystems and native and invasive plants. I've also lived in Oscar Shears State Park here in Sarasota County for over 20 years, um, where we've brought up our children and lots of animals here with us. I am very passionate about making a difference in our world through educating about our natural environment. And then my colleague, Will Mahali, will introduce herself. Yeah, I, I'm the Florida Friendly Landscape Program um, Specialist in Sarasota County. I started in um, Pinellas County in Florida Friendly Landscaping as well. I was a um, program assistant there. And um, I grew up on a farm in, in um, upstate New York, on the eastern part of New York. And I had um, some programs in, in in you know, teaching elementary students um, some environmental education and um, a lot of stuff with, with that. So it's been a lot of fun. And um, now I'm, I'm still enjoying the Florida Friendly Landscaping part. Ah, won't advance, <laughs> won't advance. There we go. Um, extension is um, a partnership between Sarasota County, the University of Florida and the USDA. The university does all the research, but they give um, us the, the information and we address our local needs because it's different in different parts of the state and we wanna bring it to people as much as possible. Of course, now when we're doing these webinars, we're getting people from all over the state, but we still kind of have local information. Um, but we have community initiatives, classes, outreach, volunteer opportunities. Um, and we provide the practical education to help all the people um, that are involved in our programs. And our extension office has all of these programs. Some of them are really, really small extension agent, um, extension class, extension offices, and they might only have two or three of these, but we're fortunate to have a large office with a lot of programs. Um, as I said, I'm Florida Friendly Landscaping, which is the highlighted in Catherine's Ecology and Natural Resources, but we do have all these others as well. Um, a lot of good programs in our office. And just some of them cover, um, Master Naturals is one of Dr. Catherine's programs. I work a lot with the Florida Master, Na um, Master Gardeners. And of course, Florida Friendly Landscaping, we have Sustainable Communities, Florida Water Stewardship Program, Family and Consumer Sciences, Sea Grant, all of these programs, 4-H is a big part of our, our office. So we do a lot of that. And a part of my program, Florida Friendly Landscaping, is these nine principles. And with, with invasive plants, we're not going to cover all of these, although they are all very much interrelated. But I highlighted the three programs because um, Right Plant, Right Place is much involved with invasive plants. You don't want the invasive plants in there. And if you put the right plants, you may not get them. Um, but And, and normal um, plants in the right place and what you want, you're trying to attract wildlife, whereas invasive plants kind of excludes wildlife in a lot of situations. And managing yard pests responsibly because invasive plants are a pest. So um, those are all, but like I said, they're all very important as part of it. And I always like to show this slide because I think the majority of people that we usually have in our programs are not from Florida. And um, they, they think they're gonna move here and it's gonna be all sun and you know sipping wine and whatever. And they get here and they start working out in the yard and they feel more like it's, it's this, but... Um, just by implementing the Florida friendly practices and identifying the weeds and controlling them, then you, that will give you more time to relax. And th these are, this is what we're gonna cover today, the definitions of uh, invasive plants, the impacts that they have on our lives, 
plants that are near you that you're going to see a lot in, um, you know, the invasive plants, and then what you can do to help. So I'm going to share some of the definitions. So in June 2020, the Journal of Extension, which is a, one of our journals, actually put out an article trying to, trying to create a standard for terminology when we talk about these different invasive species and some of the words that we use. Uh, it's a little bit like when we talk about plants, when we use the common name, things can get a little confusing, yet when you use the scientific names for plants, then you're referring to a very specific plant and you're using a name that's recognized throughout our entire world. So we're trying to create a similar standardized language when we talk about invasive species. So we're just going to go through these. Native is a species that occurs naturally in a specified geographic area. And generally when we talk about Florida, we're talking about it, the plant was recorded back in the, you know, early 1500s or 1600s when the first botanists were here. And so we have a record that that plant has been here for hundreds of years. Non-native is a species that does not occur naturally in a specified geographic area. And so a non-native was generally introduced, which introduced means a species brought to a new geographic area intentionally or unintentionally by humans. And we're going to talk more about that in a bit. And then established is a species having a self-sustaining and reproducing population in a specified geographic area without the need for human intervention. So basically that means an established plant or animal is breeding or reproducing without any human help. And established could be referring to either a native or a non-native species. Next. Invasive, which is what we're going to focus on today, are species that um, there's a number of different components that qualify a species to be invasive. So an invasive species is going to be non-native to a specified geographic area. It was introduced by humans, once again, either intentionally or unintentionally. And not only those two things, but also for a plant or animal to be labeled invasive, it also has to be causing environmental or economic harm or harm to humans. So that's the part that really makes it invasive is it's actually causing disruption to our ecological systems or our economic or human health. And then nuisance is another term that can be used for a species that causes management issues or property damage or presents a threat to public safety or is just really an annoyance. So one of the ones I usually use as an example for this category is grapevine. So muscadine grape is a native species here in Florida, but as many of you probably have experienced, it can really take over an area. Um, Carolina willow is similar, elderberry, those are some plants that are native, they do belong here in Florida, but they can, they can overgrow and become nuisances, and sometimes we have to manage those as well. And then the last term that we're going to cover is range change. Range change is when a species current or existing range grows, shrinks, or shifts over time. So it's, it's different from introduced because introduced means there was human assistance that brought a species from one place to another. Range change is when that species just sort of grows its range into a new area. And I usually talk about this in terms of animals and my examples for Florida are coyotes and armadillos. Coyotes and armadillos didn't used to be here in Florida hundreds of years ago. For instance, coyotes were sort of kept out of Florida because of red wolves. When red wolves were hunted out of Florida, then coyotes were able to naturally expand into Florida because they no longer had a predator that they needed to compete with. So we don't call them native, but they did have a range change. Next. And this, an example such as the coyote, we often call naturalized. 
Um, and this is when they have moved into an area and are breeding on their own, but they weren't here originally. So here's a quote from the National Park Service about naturalized plants. European settlers brought hundreds of plants to North America. Introductions continue today and are increasing due to an exploding human population. Many introdu introduced plants have become naturalized across the continent and some are replacing North American native plant species. Next. And a non-native plant that does not need human help to reproduce and maintain itself over time in an area where it is not native is what we call naturalized. Um, and as well as it's just self-sustaining. So even though their offspring reproduce and spread naturally without human help, naturalized plants do not over time become native members of the local plant community. They do not have those hundreds of years or thousands of years of evolution with our other native plants and animals. And so they don't, they aren't considered native and they still can be, have some issues with our ecosystems. Next. So these are some terms that have been used throughout um, different agencies and over time that uh, also are used to refer to invasive species. But once again, we're really trying to tighten up and standardize that language so that there just isn't confusion in all these different words. So alien, foreign, introduced, non-indigenous, exotic. Um, these have all been used to refer to invasive plants and animals. Um, some of them have connotations that aren't really appropriate in, in our opinion as well. So we really want to tighten that up and either a plant is native or non-native and then our non-native plants can become invasive if they qualify as becoming a problem to our ecosystems, economy, or human health. Next. And not all non-native plants do become invasive. So that's important too. We have some Florida friendly plants that are friendly to Florida that aren't originally native to Florida, but they also are not invasive and in causing problems. So here's one more definition we're gonna cover, a noxious weed. This is actually a legal regulatory definition from the Agricultural Risk Protection Act and a noxious weed is any plant or plant product that can directly or indirectly injure or cause damage to crops, livestock, poultry, or other interests of agriculture, irrigation, navigation, the natural resources of the United States, the public health, or the environment. So that's a, that's a big mouthful. But basically that's a legal definition. Um, there are both Florida listed noxious weeds and federally listed noxious weeds that are regulated. Uh, and just to remind you, an invasive species, these are the three things. It has to be non-native, it has to have been introduced either intentionally or unintentionally by humans, and the most important thing is that it actually causes harm to our economy, our environment, or to us humans. Next. And uh, we often talk about invasive species as biological pollution. And this is another quote from the National Park Service, which of course is one of our main agencies that has to manage all of these invasives. So some exotics are capable of hybridizing with native plant relatives, resulting in unnatural changes to a plant's genetic makeup. Still others contain toxins that may be lethal to certain animals. Exotic organisms have been referred to as biological pollution. In some cases, exotic plant invaders are driving our rarest species closer to extinction. So well, let's talk a little bit more about that and some of the impacts that these invasive species have. Uh, so once again, back to the National Park Service, invasive non-native organisms are one of the greatest threats to the natural ecosystems of the U.S. and are destroying America's natural history and identity. These unwelcome plants, insects, and other organisms are disrupting the ecology of natural ecosystems, displacing native plant and animal species, and degrading our nation's unique and diverse biological resources. So when we um, focus in on Florida, part of the problem is that yes, everyone is moving here. Uh, we have lots of humans moving here and humans bring things with them. 
um, but we also have lots of species that enter into our borders. So of the 4,900 identified plant species in Florida, 1,500 of those are non-native. So a third of the plants identified in our state are actually non-native plants. They aren't all invasive, but that's a lot of non-native plants, many of which have the potential or have become invasive. So invasive plants represent only 4% of the total number of that almost 5,000 identified plant species yet they comprise a third of the total plant biomass growing in Florida. So biomass is like the actual tissue of plants. So all those invasives, that just means there are a small number of invasive species, but they are growing and expanding and actually are a third of the plant biomass in our state. And then we have over 500 non-native fish and wildlife species and thousands of other non-native things that are much smaller, like insects, mites, nematodes, fungi, and microbes. And we talk about some of those in part four, which is our invasive animal presentation. So also plants and animals know no borders. And 85% of non-native plants in our country come in through the Port of Miami. 25,000 plants are introduced every year, either purposely or inadvertently. In Florida, we have some of the largest ports in the country, and we have a very active aquarium, landscape, nursery, and florist trade um, that brings some of these things in. Also, inadvertently, things are introduced in the ballast waters of ships that have traveled from other places. They're transported by machinery, cars, or boats, like you see on this picture. Um, human travelers bring back souvenirs. And then when we talk about animals, also the exotic pet trade is an avenue for introduction of invasive animals. So non-native plants can love Florida. I mean, why do we all come here, those of us that aren't native to this state? Because there's an amazing climate. There's a tropical or subtropical climate. There's a long growing season. There's vast agricultural lands, which often are the perfect place for some of our invasive grasses and other plants to take hold. We have a seasonal population um, where either we have out-of-state landowners that aren't always available to take care of their properties, or we have um, people that are coming down here to visit who just don't understand how, uh, how much of a threat these invasive species are and want their yards to look more like the yards they had up north, and we're not up north, we're in Florida. There's also a greater urban wildland interface, and those disturbed areas between development areas and more natural lands can often be an avenue for those invasive species to get into our more natural areas as well. Next. An invasive spread really rapidly. They have a number of different strategies to help them sort of take over or spread. So they often grow really quickly. They often have lots of generations. So rapid reproductive cycles and or high fecundity, meaning in each of those generations, they also have a lot of offspring. Um, our invasive species often have behavioral plasticity, meaning they're tolerant to a wide range of conditions uh, where they might be able to deal with different climates, different levels of uh, dampness or drought, um, and different levels of temperature or salinity in the soil. So they're more capable of spreading. And often there's a lack of their native control, either like with um, animals, it can be a lack of their native predator, or with plants, it could be the lack of a disease or an insect that sort of keeps their growth in check in their native area. Next. So why is this even a problem? Why are we even talking about this? Why can't we just let these plants and animals in and just let them grow or live wherever they do? Well, because these invasive species outcompete our native species, and they are also pushing some of our threatened species to extinction. Um, up to 42% of our extinct species are directly or indirectly linked to invasive species. Um, also, some of our invasive plants may increase wildfire risk and increase fire fuel. 
And some of our tall non-natives are unstable in tropical events, and so they're not really safe as well. And invasive species are very difficult and expensive to control. Here are just some of the costs. Uh, about 10 years ago, which is the most recent data I could find, um, Florida spent over $23 million fighting invasive plants in our state, and the annual cost to the United States economy was estimated at $120 billion a year in 2005. Over 100 million acres, which is basically the size of California, is considered to be suffering from invasive plant infestations in our country. And invasive, oh, here's the part about invasive species have contributed directly to the decline of 42% of threatened and endangered species in the United States. And then before I turn it back over to Wilma, we're just gonna take a look at this invasive species curve. This is a diagrammatic um, graph that helps us sort of understand how out of control this problem can become. So on the left-hand side of that graph is where um, plants are, or the invasive species have not entered into their non-native range yet. And so this is when we want to be doing prevention. And just like with human men medicine, prevention is cheaper than trying to find a cure. So we want to try to prevent species that we think might become a problem here in Florida from even entering into Florida. Uh, once a species enters into a geographic area, and you can see the little green arrow towards the bottom of the graph there, um, now we're in a situation where if that species is becoming a threat or becoming invasive, we are in the stage of eradication. So now we're using manpower and money and other resources like equipment um, to try to eradicate this species. And sometimes we're able to do that. But if the species continues to spread over time, if it's invasive, there's going to be more of that and it's going to take up a larger area and we're going to be in the containment stage at that point. Um, and once things are no longer able to be contained, for instance, something like Brazilian pepper tree, which Wilma's going to talk about, that's one of our worst offenders in our state. Then we're way at the top of the curve where we're talking about asset-based protection, where for instance, we're just trying to keep Brazilian pepper tree out of our natural areas so it doesn't take over our Florida ecosystems. We're trying to keep it out of our mangrove forest so we have healthy coastal uh, mangrove areas. And once you're in asset-based protection, you're using a lot of resources, you're using multiple agencies to try to address the problem, and you're no longer going to be able to get back down the curve to eradication at that point. So we really want to try to get these things early and manage them early so that we can maintain some of our natural Florida ecosystems. I'm going to hand it over to Wilma now, and she's going to go into individual plants. Okay, so first we're going to talk about a couple of trees. Most of the plants are, are not trees. Um, those are some more that, that Catherine will be doing um, when she does the, the next section on plants in natural areas, but I'm doing a couple of programs first in, in the near you, but carrot wood is one that you see in yards and neighborhoods and they've been planted pretty much all over Florida because for a long time they were considered a good street tree because they were small. They only got up to around 25, 30 feet tall. And people just loved them because of the little bit of shade they could get from them. And, but then they found out how bad they started spreading. Now you can see them coming up in hedges all over the place. They, they have huge bundles of seed pods. And then when those open up, each one of them has three seeds in time inside of it. At first they're reddish, that's an arrow that's covering it, and then when that coating comes off it's black inside. Um, and if you have one near a sidewalk, you're out there constantly sweeping the sidewalk off. Um, I, Where I lived, where I was renting, I could not cut the tree down so I was stuck with it and it was, it was miserable. Um, it's an ecological threat, it alters understory habitat, and it's just just to show you how much an understory habitat can get um, altered. This, this was underneath the tree I had, and of course I pulled all these out, but this is a thousand seedlings 
that were in a four foot by an 18 inch area that I pulled out. That, that that's not very big. That, you know, this wide and you know as far as my arms can reach long, and um, they they were just all over the place. And I actually took a thousand of these. I put them all in one bundle and took them into one of our commercial classes and passed them around and had people guess what they were. And because of the way they were bunched together, they all thought it was a ground cover or something. Um, a lot of them thought it was oak tree seedlings. So when, when they're young, they look a lot different, of course, than when they start growing. And, and you can see one down here in the corner that had gotten a little bit bigger. And you can see that familiar yellow stripe and the waviness to the leaves. But um, that's something that they just spread like crazy. And here you can see a tree with a whole bunch of those bunches. And, um, and then here in the, in the lower picture where they're starting to um, open. And this is, um, it is a compound leaf. You can see it's, it's fairly large by the size of that, that hand there with, um, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, around seven leaflets. Sometimes there's more, sometimes less, but generally around seven. Um, and the, the biggest control measure is um, pulling the seedlings. And then if the tree's already going to cut the tree and then treat the cut stump. Brazilian pepper tree, this is the other one that Catherine had mentioned. Um, it's just, just a horrible tree in our environment. Um, this picture here shows what the little seedlings look like. I'm constantly pulling those out of my yard. I don't have any trees in my yard, but in um, I live in Northport in Florida and there's a lot of empty lots still in Northport. So there are these trees in those lots and um, constantly have to pull those out. And then this is of course, once it's growing and starts producing berries. But um, it's on the prohibited list in Florida, which means that um, you cannot possess it with the intent to sell or plant. And it's also on FLEPSI category one. FLEPSI is the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council, which recently changed their name. Um, wait, but when you look it up, you still find it under FLEPSI. You can't, when, when you look it up under the new name, which I believe is Florida, do you, do you remember, Catherine, Florida Invasive Species Council or something like that? Um, you still find it under FLEPSI. You, you can't find it under the new name yet. So they're, they're still in the process of um, changing all that. Um, it was native to Brazil and Paraguay, introduced in the 19th century. And it's found in Central and South Florida, a little bit in North Florida, but it generally freezes in North Florida. So I'm um, not up there too much. It was introduced in the 19th century. Oh, I already just said that. It's one of the most widespread of um, the introduced non-native plants in Florida. And it loves disturbed and fire excluded sites. It forms dense forests and it's also adjacent to our mangrove communities. And, and that can be a problem because it intertwines in with the mangroves and really changes that habitat. And there's not any good, um, habitat in the Brazilian peppers, but it destroys habitat in the mangroves, which is a vital habitat for um, things along the edge there. And um, this is the flowers on the Brazilian um, peppers. And it, it does spread long, it's facilitated by birds and mammals, and it, it can also have a narcotic or a toxic effect. Um, it's sometimes called um, Florida house. Yeah. It's not even related to hollies, but because it, it looks similar to hollies in, in um, the winter when it's got the berries on it. Um, actually, um, I've heard of robins and other birds get drunk on it because they just eat so many and then it just kind of, too much of anything is, is bad for, for even animals. It's also sometimes sold as pink peppercorns and it's used in wreaths. Actually, is not legal. Um, but people don't know that, so they use it. Um, it's related to poison ivy the, um, and, and oak, and the sap can irritate um, because it is in the Anacardiaceae family. Yeah. Um, could everybody make sure they're muted? I'm getting some feedback there. 
And this is a tree in bloom. You can see just all those blooms on there all over. There's probably more than one tree, actually. There's actually two or three in this picture. This is one of the empty lots in Northport. They're all covered with them. And this is later on after all the berries start getting on there. And at one time I, I counted and estimated how many extrapolated the, the estimate to how many was in, in each bunch, but I've forgotten what it was, but I think it was something like 300 in each bunch. And you can see there's hundreds of bunches. Anyways, just to say that, that once you, there's just way too many and, and just about every single one of those will grow spread by birds and everything else. So um, a lot of them. And uh, coat buttons, Tridex procumbens. A few years ago, I had never heard of this. And one day there was a couple of them out in our, um, our garden at, at Twin Lakes Park. It was actually in the, the uh, butterfly garden. And, uh, and somebody said, well, but what is this? And I said, I don't know. And they said, well, should we pull it? And then we decided, well, let's wait until we find out what it is because it might be a good plant. Well, it took a couple of weeks, but I finally found out what it was. And we went out and pulled them all immediately. But since then, I have seen it all over the place. It's, it's on the prohibited species list. And that's how I finally figured out what it was because I was going through the, that list and learning those plants. And all of a sudden I came to the last one on the list at the time. I think there's another one on there now. Um, but it's native to South and Central America and it does spread rapidly because now at Twin Lakes Park where our office is, we find it all over the place. It's spread by seeds and it grows rapidly. It's on the federal noxious weed list. The flowers are similar to Biden's Elba, although the, the center is darker and there's more petals on Biden's Elba. But um, if you know what that is, um, if not, it doesn't matter <laughs> anyways. But um, it's a ground cover and the leaves are thicker than Biden's Elba and usually have a kind of a silvery tinge to them, although you can't really tell that in this picture as much. Um, the the Tridax, the, the Latin name comes from the, the petals. They have um, three points on them. You can't really tell that good in these pictures, but, um, and this, this was along our sidewalk at Twin Lakes Park. Um, five years ago, there was maybe one or two plants we saw there and along the fence line, and now there's hundreds. And of course, we pull them out when we can, but it's an area where, where we don't use that much, and they just they fill in so fast that we cannot keep rid of them. Wadilia, this is a plant that, um, in, in this location, this was a park in Sarasota up off of Fruitville Road, and it, it was just mowed. This, this is all Wedelia. There's a tiny bit of grass tufts in there, but all this ground cover was Wedelia and they just mowed over it. Um, it's invasive, no uses. It's native to Central and South America. And unfortunately, it still is sold in garden centers. I used to work at a garden center in between um, working in Pinellas County and, and down here in Sarasota County. And um, when people asked me for it, I kind of hemmed and hawed. I, you know, as a good employee, I couldn't say, no, we don't have that, but I, I, if nobody was listening, I'd try to convince them to buy something different. Um, sometimes I, I didn't have a choice. Um, it was introduced before 1933. It's a serious weed in crops and lawns. It's a ground cover. It spreads really rapidly because it roots at the, nose, at the nodes. It reproduces vegetatively, um, but it it produces very little, if any, seeds. So at least we don't have to worry about the seeds. But because it roots at every single node, it can really spread rapidly in lawns and all. And I've even seen pieces that a lawnmower has carried from one lawn to another and actually rooting in that new lawn. So it roots quite easy. It can lay there for two or three days and you know, it doesn't wilt hardly at all in those two or three days. And if it rains or anything, then that sinks it down into the lawn and it just roots and starts growing. So that's something that to be wary of. It forms a dense mat that crowds out native vegetation. One way to control it is by pulling and properly disposing. You can't dump it because that results in regeneration and then it spreads, but you can usually would need to follow up with a weed killer 
um, and continued vigilance is necessary to make sure that you got all the roots because it's hard to get every single root out and, and you, wa you want to follow up and make sure you're not, um, you know, that, that you get it all, which does require follow up. So phasey bean or wild bush bean. This one is native to Central and South America and Mexico. It's a high invasion risk, which means they haven't put it on one of the invasive species lists yet, but it spreads so rapidly that it, it probably will be added. Um, they reassess these every few years and um, it's spread throughout Florida. It forms dense monocultures. It's especially bad in the Florida Keys, but this is one, um, it spread, it has numerous seeds. We, this is one we have at Twin Lakes Park, which is where our office is also. And um, one year um, we had one plant that we saw and everybody thought it was a butterfly plant and they didn't want to get rid of it. In fact, they wanted to sell it at the plant sale because they thought it was a good plant. But then when we found out what it was, we obviously didn't sell it, but they held it. And within a few years, it had started spreading all over the park. So we, we pulled out hundreds and hundreds of plants. Fortunately, we have a lot of good Master Gardener volunteers. I would say they pulled them out. Um, and we got rid of most of it there at the park, but we still have to follow up because some of the seeds re remain um, dormant for a while and then, you know, start growing later. But the flowers are variable. Sometimes they're more of a reddish or a pinkish. Sometimes they're more maroonish. But you can see how bad that they can spread and make a monoculture there in, in this picture. Um, continually pulling is, is a good way to control it. But if you get a huge um, growth like that, you probably would need to do some spraying. Um, we, we managed to, to pull ours out and keep it under control. Chinese crown orchid, this is one that currently is only on the um, caution list but it spreads, you can see just here by this little picture, how, how many have started growing up next to this main bulb. It's, it's actually an orchid, it's in the orchid family, Orchidaceae, but, um, and it's native to temperate and tropical Asia. Um, unfortunately in Florida, it does form dense monoculture and it has spread to 13 counties in Florida. And this was a few years ago that, that I got this information. So I'm sure by now it's spread to several other counties. It was originally found in mulch and that is one place where it really, really grows. Um, when you put down new mulch, it spreads by spores. I mean, it's very, very fine seeds. You can't, you can't even see the seeds. Um, so it's more like spores than seeds. So it's almost like a dust. So then it, it kind of just spreads out and um, people find it in mulch, so they think it came in the mulch. But um, I, t I talked to one of the um, people up at the university, and he said it. He said it probably does have a symbiotic relationship with the mulch. But as far as they can tell, it doesn't doesn't come in the mulch. It just spreads in the mulch really easily. And I found a lot of it in my house in my yard um, in mulch after I put it down. And this picture here was underneath a bag of mulch that I had left over the winter. And when I lifted up the bag of mulch underneath it, this had started growing. And these are little pseudo bulbs. So you have your main bulb and there wasn't a main bulb here actually. I just had these little pseudo bulbs. So obviously some spores or seed had gotten into that area and they just started growing and they were forming all these little bulbs. So if I had left those, which I didn't obviously, but if I had left those, each one of those would have made a bulb and I would have had a big monoculture area in just a short time. And you gotta get every single one of those pseudo bulbs. A lot of times I'll pull out a big bulb and if I don't dig down in with a trowel, you end up leaving a couple of pseudo bulbs. So you're having to also go in later, you'll see new growth and you say, oh, I must have missed a pseudo bulb and you're having to pull it out. So it's best to dig down in around the bulb instead of just pulling the bulb. Um, so Lantana, this is um, invasive in North Central and South Florida. It's native to Central and South America and Mexico. Um, this one is one that the people don't want to get rid of because it's such a pretty plant. And it also has been used in the greenhouse 
um, its popularity in the greenhouse and plant industry um, and has spread the plant worldwide. This particular one grows up to six feet. It has opposite leaves with a sandpapery feel. Um, and it's spread by seed production. Cutting and spraying can help control it, but it needs a management plan because there's so many seeds. Um, biological control is controversial because of the ornamental industry, because they have so many plants and they sell so many that they don't want to get rid of it. However, the um, University of Florida has actually developed other varieties that are sterile. So my recommendation is to make sure if you if you have to have this plant to plant, there's two native varieties of lantana, lantana and volucrata, which gets up to, it's nowhere near as pretty, but it's still really beneficial to butterflies and pollinators, which is usually the reason that people plant it. Um, but plant some of the sterile varieties or the, um, the native varieties. Lantana depressa is the other native variety. And you can see by all these arrows, how many seeds, and, and half of the seeds are already gone on here. You can see a big bunch there in the middle where they haven't disappeared yet, but some of these, most of the seeds are already gone and they haven't even developed yet where these flowers are. So every single one of those is gonna make a new plant and you can just see there's tons and tons of them. Um, and so by using a sterile variety that's not gonna get seeds probably is the best thing uh, or planting the native varieties, that's even better than, than the sterile varieties. Southern balsam pear, Mamortica balsamina. Um, there's also a Mamortica charantia, and it's a little hard to tell the difference. I think the, the fruit on the charantia is a little bit longer, um, but otherwise it's quite hard to tell them about. But it's, they're, it's a high invasion risk for the whole state. They, are, um, they do spread rapidly. I think in the north they would probably freeze, so I'm not sure how much they are in the northern states. But the vine covers whole plants. It spreads by seeds. And it, it just, um, it's amazing how it, it can cover an area. This, there's a, actually a shrub underneath this plant. That's, it looks like somebody shaped it, but that's the shrub underneath that was shaped. Um, the leaves are deeply lobed. There's yellow flowers you can see here. It, the pollinators do like it. So most all of the fruit, most all the flowers get pollinated. And then that fruit develops. And then when the fruit opens up, it's got those red seeds in it. Um, there's several seeds in each fruit. So it just, it spreads rapidly because of that. And, and, and especially in disturbed areas. And you can see here in this top left picture, um, the first leaves that come out from seedlings are, are not lobed, but then as soon as the first true leaves get on there, they're lobed, and then it starts binding right away. This is an area where they had just cut out Brazilian pepper, and of course, um, once those seeds were open to the daylight and everything, they just started spreading tremendously. You can see a little close up there, and then another bunch of um, hedges where it was growing over in front of a house that you know, probably not maintain that much. So um, really spreads rapidly in the right conditions. This is a fence. This is here in Northport also covered with it. Um, just really should be pulled out. And because it also goes up into the trees, I've seen it 15, 20 feet up into the trees once it spreads. Golden pothos. This one is invasive in South Florida, caution in Central Florida and not a problem species in North Florida. And that's because of um, freezing in North Florida and sometimes in Central Florida. Um, it's really one you do not want to plant in the ground. If you have it as a house plant, keep it inside or make sure that the, the fronds, don't, the strands don't spread down and, and reach into the ground because it, it will take over a yard. And, and then it starts growing up the trees and it can um, climb in trees and the larger, um, the leaves get larger, the higher they grow, they can cut out photosynthesis and just the weight of the plant alone can damage trees. It can pull it down, um, it alters habitat. Um, the best method of control is pulling. Obviously you can't get up in the tree to pull it, but you can cut the, the branches underneath, you know, the stems underneath. The, the plants up in the tree may remain alive um, during a real wet time. If it's not wet, then they may um, dry out and fall off. Um, spraying is extremely difficult because of the height 
and then the spray, the, the leaves are so waxy that the spray doesn't adhere to the leaves. So this is something that's going to have to have a management plan that um, continual efforts to remove because you're not going to get it all at once. Arrowhead vine, similar in growth habit as the pothos. The leaves don't get quite as big. Um, invasive, no uses for the whole state. It's native to Central and South America and Mexico. It is a vine, it can smother trees and shrubs. It's often sold as a house plant. It still is because they've developed new varieties of it, but they can be just as invasive. Um, people go up north, leave it sitting outside in the summer, and then it goes wild. And I'm going to show you one of the ones that is sold as a house plant um, because it's hard to believe that that's the same plant as this. It, it is. Once the plant goes up in the tree, it spreads out a lot more. So you, you don't even realize it's the same plant. And of course, this is a variegated one, so it looks a lot different. But um, again, you want to cut it at the base, requires repeat vigilance, spray where possible. Again, um, the leaves aren't quite as waxy as a pothos, but it can be hard to adhere to that. And also spraying up in the tree is hard because you don't want to spray stuff that's underneath it. So it's, it's going to, like I said, repeat vigilance. It's another, the, that and the pothos are both houseplant escapees. People put them out in the yard over the summer and then they go crazy. Um, pipe vine, calico flower, Aerosolochia littoralis. High invasion risk for the whole state, native to South America. It's a vine and it gets hundreds and hundreds of seeds. So, and they just about all grow. We have one of these, unfortunately, in our butterfly garden, which probably I will be removing. Um, I don't like to tick off the master gardeners, but um, this one, the more I find out how invasive this is and how it spreads, we do not want to have it in the garden. So um, the biggest, easiest way to, re, to pull this is to pull the seedlings, cut back the vines, and then spray. Cut them back first because you don't want to be spraying up on the whole fence. And once you cut those, the, the ones on the fence are going to die. If they're on a tree, you can't always spray. But if you cut the base, a lot of the upper ones will die. And then spray the lower vines and then repeat if necessary. And just, just keep vigilance over that because... That's something you have to be careful of. Um, this is an open seed pod, and that is just full of seeds. It looks like a cute little basket. It's kind of neat, has heart-shaped leaves, which people like, but again, not something you want growing in your yard or at your work even. Um, white sky vine, this is another one that was just added to the high invasion risk in all of Florida, native to temperate and tropical Asia. It's a vine, it seeds very heavily, and it grows very rapidly. And this is one I had planted in my yard before it was added to the high invasion risk. And it's a little bit difficult to, to get rid of. The leaves are a little bit waxy, so it's kind of hard to spray. Um, in my yard, I, I thought I had it all pulled out, but I found some seeds had spread that I didn't know about. So I pretty much need to um, try again. Um, this is a Thunbergia. I think I had that on, yeah, Thunbergia. Pretty much most of the Thunbergias, not every single one, but a lot of them have been added to the high invasion risk. So even though they're really beautiful flowers, it's not one you want to have growing in your yard. Um, you do need to use a spreader sticker if you spray because of those waxy leaves. Florida snow, also called large flower pusley, large flower Mexican clover. There's three different um, ricardias that grow in Florida. This one has by far the largest flowers and it is also one that spreads worse than any of the other. One of the ricardias is native, but it has tiny flowers. Um, this one's a caution in the whole state. I know um, Sarasota South, it's a large problem. I'm not sure how, how much of a problem it is in Northern Florida. Um, the flowers can be white to a very, very light pink to a little bit more of a pink. Um, it spreads and grows rapidly from the seeds and it roots at the nodes. So that's vegetatively and um, by seeds. So that's two ways that it spreads. And let me tell you, in Northport, it's a huge problem. When I first moved from, from St. Pete to Sarasota and then on to Northport, 
there was maybe one or two tiny little patches that we used to see. And, and people would say, what is that? That's kind of pretty. And I was like, I don't know. But then I found out what it was. And over the course of the last 10 years since I've been in Sarasota and then in Northport, it has spread rampantly. It's, it should be on the invasive species yet, but they haven't added it yet, probably because it's not such a problem in the colder areas of the state. But this is a lawn in Northport. Um, it, it's just, it's amazing. Even in my yard, my neighbor's yard, a couple of years ago, there were no plants in, in this yard. This, this was non-existent. There was almost all grass. And then it has just spread um, rampantly from their yard to my yard, to my, our, all of the neighbor's yards, it's just there. It grows from a taproot. And if you can get through the crisscross branches, they kind of grow every which way. Um, you can pull one plant and it, it'll be several feet wide. I mean, it just spreads on out. I've, I've pulled one, I've gotten to the center, pulled it and, and pulled all the where it started rooting down because I just wanted to see how big the plant was. And it, it was about three feet wide. Um, just an enormous mass. Um, generally, it's a ground cover, but it can grow up and through and over other plants. It got in my, my, <laughs> this is a, a succulent garden and it killed all the smaller plants. I had to have surgery and I couldn't get out there for a couple of years. Um, well, Two, two different summers I had surgery. I did get out in between and thought I had gotten it all out, but of course I didn't, um, I wasn't able to control the seed. So it actually killed all the smaller plants, the, the larger plants it didn't crawl up over, but it did crawl up through some of them. And um, this area right here, I pulled all these weeds, there's this huge bunch from this area pulled there. That filled a 90 gallon um, container recycling container um, just from that really small area. So I got several containers out of that whole area. So it's a huge problem now in, in our area and in Sarasota County and below Sarasota County. I'm not sure how far north it has spread. Anyway, Caesar's weed. This is one that um, also is a problem in my yard and, and surrounding areas. Um, this is actually my neighbor's yard. I went in and pulled all those out because they're not there most of the time and I didn't want them spreading into my yard. It spreads prolifically from seed mainly, um, but it gets up to 10 feet tall. It's an herbaceous perennial, which means it, it just has kind of stems that come back. Um, it it kind of dies down in the wintertime and you see all these woody stems. I've actually gone in and pulled those out as well because the seeds remain on there um, and the seeds, the, the leaves are going to vary in size and shape. They're generally slightly lobed. Um, the seeds have hooks on them that if you think of Velcro, that's exactly what they act like. And it's found in disturbed areas, but it's also found in home landscapes. It's found in parks. Um, and a few of these plants that I'm covering Catherine's also going to cover in her natural areas class because some of these are such a problem in both areas that we want to make sure that that people um, are aware of them. And I've had we have a lot of people bring this into the office and ask what it is. So we, we're covering it in both. Mulch helps to control the seed germination, but it's something that you want to pull the plants out before they seed down as much as possible. Um, here's some after it started growing in my neighbor's yard. Um, the, well, this was actually part of the empty lot. I did go in and pull all those out. You can see how the seeds start developing along the stems and it gets a lot, a lot of seeds. This is the flowers before the seeds start, but you can see the seeds have already started. It blooms for a long, long time and develops a lot, a lot of seed, seeds. These are seedlings when they first start. Um, you can see they're, they're already starting to get that shape and then they get a little bit bigger. Um, not much of a shape to them there, just the seedlings before the true leaves get on there. Not much shape there, but then within a few weeks, they've already developed and started growing. This was a hundred seedlings that I pulled out. They pull out really easily when they're first young. Um, it's kind of a taproot. You can, you can get them pulled out when they're bigger, but 
it takes a lot more effort. It's going to knock you down a few times when you pull and they all of a sudden let loose. And you can see each seed um, bunch breaks up and then into the several different seed lobes. And you can see how it looks almost like Velcro. And they do stick to you like Velcro. Here's um, this picture is in the winter when, when all the leaves have pretty much died off. There's a few leaves left on. And you can just see thousands and thousands of seeds in that bunch. There's another empty lot near me. And you can see how they stick to you. I went in and pulled all those out. And of course, there were all those seeds on them. So when you walk through an area, you need to make sure that you pick all these off and put them in a bag or put them in the trash because you do not want them to be inadvertently be spreading these seeds. <coughs> Crow's foot grass. Another, um, there's several invasive grasses. This one is easily identifiable by this starfish shape. Look to it. It's invasive, no uses in central and south Florida, not a problem in north, it's a caution in north Florida. It's native to Africa, temperate and tropical Asia. It's a prolific seed producer. You can see all those seeds. And there's a lot, a lot of seeds. This is in bloom. The pollen is still hanging on there, the seed heads. Um, but they're, they're already starting to develop. Um, you can control with regular mowing if it happens to be in your yard. This here was along the roadway, um, which they do mow two or three times a year, but the seeds have time to develop in between. So also in your yard, hand pulling. Um, and if it's in an area where you can, um, uh, spraying would, would help to um, eliminate that. Um, torpedo grass, this one is my arch enemy. <laughs> I, I have pulled and pulled and pulled these. Did not know how, um, how badly they spread from roots. It's native to Africa and Asia and Europe. It was introduced in 1920. They thought it would be good for agriculture, but by 1992, it had taken over 70% of Florida's public waters. Sharply pointed torpedo-like growing trips, tips, and it's extremely hard to control. Um, you're gonna to have to spray with herbicides on this when you cannot pull it out and it's gonna take multiple resprays. Um, I thought that I could pull it out. I was planting a whole, one day, a couple years ago, I was planting a whole bunch of one gallon plants and I started digging holes and all of a sudden I realized that was torpedo grass roots in there. So I actually had gloves on and I started digging and digging and digging and um, by the end of the day, I had some of the holes ended up being big enough to plant a 20 gallon pot in. But because I was digging so much with my hands, even with the gloves on, I actually had damaged my fingernails to the point that I lost four of my fingernails. You know, I had no idea I was doing that. I just, I knew my hands were sore and I was getting tired, but I wanted to get all the roots out. Well, guess what? I didn't get them all out. I missed a few and I still have that problem. I'm still having to respray. I'm still trying to control it in that area. Um, it loves water and that is the area where I was planting my, my plants that need more moisture because it was in the swale area of my property. So it stays wetter there and they just, um, you, you can, um, I saw somebody put Roundup kills everything it touches. It doesn't kill everything. It won't kill this. It will um, damage it for a while. It kills it back to the ground, but it doesn't follow the roots all the way. And these roots can spread five feet underground. So it does damage it and it might take a few weeks for it to come back. But that's why you have to keep um, respraying it. There's a, another product called Fusilade that works really good on, on the grass because the fusillade doesn't damage other plants as much, um, but still it's, it's one that you have to keep working at. Um, and this is just some places where it started growing up in my yard. It has a distinct look when it first starts growing. It actually will grow up through blacktop as well. That's um, one, of the, one of the jokes I always make is I tell people how, I know how to get rid of it and they say, how? And I go, move. Well, I did move and I thought I was rid of it, but unfortunately, when I started digging, I realized that that, that was torpedo grass in my yard. Um, fusillade, I think you have one too many L's in it, but otherwise you got it right. 
Um, and here's just some more. Um, actually, this way you can see how it spreads from node to node to node, and it just comes, it pops up all over the place on each node. But you can also see from this pit, this next picture that it makes these little bunches and those will spread out in each direction. So it can spread extremely rapidly. And here's just some pictures of it growing in my yard, unfortunately. It does, it, it has a very distinct look growing. It, it, it ha, I call it a ladder-like look, um, like rungs on a ladder, although the, the center would, you know, a ladder wouldn't have that wouldn't be in the center, but just just something to where I can recognize it easy is, is that look. Um, and the torpedo like edge, like, like I say that torpedo point, it can grow through um, blacktop. It, it's amazing how fast it can spread. And I normally have a, a portion that I read on that, but I forgot to get it out this time. It just, just know that it's, it's a horrible plant. Um, blue porter weed, nettle leaf porter weed um, has a couple different names. There's a couple of invasive species, but there's also the Stachytarphita jamaicensis, which is a native plant. This one is the Stachytarphita jamaicensis, the blue porter weed, is um, lower to the ground. It only gets maybe 18 to 24 inches, whereas the, the invasive one, the Stachytarphita cayensis and Urticosifolia, that one actually gets up to about four feet. So there's quite a bit of difference there. It's on the caution list for the whole state. It's native to Central and South America and Mexico. It seeds prolifically. You can see the flowers on this develop a few at a time up along the stem and then it just gradually spreads up to the top. Well, each place after these flowers grow, seeds develop. And there can be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of seeds and they can take over a whole garden. I've seen them grow. Um, one place where I worked before I was even in extension at a school where I worked, um, the whole they had this little butterfly garden. It was about five feet wide by 20 feet long. And that's all that was in there. This had taken over the whole garden. Everything else had gotten crowded out. So that's how fast and bad it can spread. That, that was over a couple of years. Um, somebody said you can cook the shoots and eat like asparagus and eat the flowers. I've never tried that. That's not one that I heard. And I opened the wrong one. Um, <laughs> Catherine, this is one that I had taken out to put in next. But anyway, since it's here now, it's native to South Africa. It's one that spreads by tubers and birds eating the seeds and dispersing it. It escapes cultivation and grows aggressively in natural areas. It's cautionless for all of Florida. Um, it just really displaces native vegetation. It tolerates sun or shade. It's very, very difficult to remove because of the roots, massive root structures that regrows from root pieces. Um, the first step in control is convincing people not to plant it, remove the plants before seeds are produced. Cutting does provide some control, but it needs an herbicide to really control it. There's no known biological control and you can just see it spreads, grows rapidly in huge bunches. Here's a place where somebody had planted it. I think this may have been up near Gainesville because Anne Murray um, worked for the University of Florida, um, but I'm not sure exactly where that one was, but you can see um, it used to be planted all the time. I think now a lot of people, because of how hard it is to control and dig out of a yard, they've it's gone out of favor, but um, still one you wanna watch. Snake plant, Bowstring hemp, it gets called a lot, mother-in-law's tongue. Um, it's now been put in the Dracaena family. Um, it used to be called Sansevieria, and that's still one of the common names, but the Latin name now is Dracaena hyacinthioides. Um, this one is invasive with no uses um, for Central Florida. It's caution in North Florida and it's invasive, um, it really spreads rapidly. There's a couple places in Sarasota County that it was planted years ago, and now they're trying to get rid of it. One of the places was Spanish Point, um, and it's it's taken over the whole, the whole place. They're having so much trouble getting rid of it. Um, it's very difficult to control, very difficult to dig out because you have to get every single rhizome, um, and it's just, 
just a hard, hard plant. It is still sold. Thank you, Alina. Um, still sold as a, a house plant. It, there's several varieties of this though. Um, here's another one that's only a Dracaena trifasciata, which is a high invasion risk. So another one that you don't want to plant. Um, and here's another one, Cylindrica Dracaena angloensis or Sansevieria cylindrica. You're still gonna find these under the old Latin names. Um, this one has very cylindrical leaves, not a problem species, but my recommendation on any of the snake plants, because as time goes on, some of these will um, probably be readjusted to the invasive plant list. Um, because the leaves are so waxy on these, really, really hard to spray. You can't really spray them. It just runs right off. And because the rhizomes are so thick, very, very difficult to, to, to spray or, or control. Digging out, and, it, and believe me, it takes a lot of digging. And this will actually grow through black, blacktop too. One of the site visits on HOA that I visited had it, they had planted it along a wall and there was only about a foot, foot and a half area, maybe, yeah, probably about 18 inch area. And um, it had spread to two feet, it's probably spreading on the other side of the wall that they don't even know, you know, it's not their property on the other side, but it had come up out into the blacktop this far. Granted, the blacktop along the edge was fairly thin, but um, it was still spreading several inches out into the blacktop. So they were wondering how to get rid of it. And that was an area where they could spray it they probably couldn't dig it all because they don't want to chop up their blacktop, but they it would take repeat springs. It's not something to easily get rid of. So um, in order to get rid of plants and some of the problems with plants, you need to understand integrated pest management. And um, you want to be sustainable. You don't want to just go in there and randomly spray things, especially without knowing what's around it and invasive plants plants spreading over something else. Um, sustainability is using a resource so that that resource is not depleted or permanently damaged. So you don't wanna damage other plants, which is other resource. But one of the most important things is identification and scouting. You wanna scout areas completely. Like in my yard, I constantly get seedlings of carrot woods. I get seedlings of Brazilian pepper, I get um, Caesar's weed, several other plants that I get in my yard. So when they're really small, they're really extremely easy to pull out. So I just constantly am going through my yard, identifying what's in there, pulling out. If I'm not sure what something is, I might let it grow until I can identify it, but I never leave anything that's going to be invasive. Um, yeah, the some of them get ahead of me, like that Florida snow, that's, that's next to impossible to control but I still pull it out when I can. If it's in the lawn, I'm mowing it off so it's not able to spread as far. And I don't have a very big lawn, but I still am, am preventing it where possible. Cultural practices are pulling things out when there are biological methods and you can um, use one of those for, for plant, especially if it's in a natural area where you're not allowed to go in and spray or remove. Um, and sometimes you can get permission in a natural area if it's bordering you and you have them on the edge. I know somebody in um, Sarasota County just got permission from um, the land the people to remove some, some bad invasive plants along the edge of their property that was in a natural area. Um, so physical methods, removing them. And then the last, last resort is going down to the chemical methods. You don't want to use chemicals if you can at all avoid it. So treatment ops and biological control. There's been several plants that have been used for um, successfully for using biological control. The, this picture here is the um, air potato beetle. Um, and you can request those, but because there has been such a high demand for those, they, they have run out of, of just sending them to everybody that requests. So now they get all the requests in 
and then they'll send them usually to parks or natural areas in an area that may be close to some of the other people that request them so they have a chance to develop and grow and then they'll come out from the the natural areas and go into people's yards and backyards in northport where i see um a lot of the air potato i also see a lot of these air potato beetles and they're not going to kill the plant um but they can um stun it enough that it slows it down or that it can't develop the tubers and this is a plant that um catherine will be talking about in her section on natural areas uh, another um successful was uh tropical soda apple beetle and that's one um that she will also be talking about um but and then the melaleuca psyllid and, and there's a weevil for melaleuca they've also just released one within the last couple of years, I think maybe last year, early in the year um, for Brazilian pepper. So there are a lot of successful examples, but it takes years to develop these because they have to make sure that it's safe to introduce. They have to control it in a lab until they eventually determine that it's not going to eat anything else. They have to put all the different kinds of relatives of the plant in there and make sure that it doesn't eat anything else. It doesn't eat any native plants. Um, so it, it usually takes 10 to 15 years before they're able to um, release one of these biological controls. So um, other treatment options for chemicals, some of the considerations you want to make sure that you're not, um, first of all, you want to wear proper um, personal protection equipment. That's what PPE is. Um, and you want to make sure you're not hitting any non-target. You don't want any collateral damage on people's plants or animals. So extreme caution. The label is the law on all of these. Um, and you want to make sure there's specificity to the plant and the time and the amount of area and the type of the application. Um, so all those things, temperatures, um, time of year, the how the plant, what stage the plant is at, those are all going to be considerations to make when you um, apply any chemical. And and my um, my personal, um, I guess my personal opinion is. You don't want to use chemicals unless you absolutely have to. If there's another way of getting rid of a plant, that's what you want to do first because chemicals do have far reaching effects. But if you have to use one like torpedo grass, you're not going to get rid of any other way unless you can get a backhoe in and dig down 10 feet and, and um, sift all the soil. And I mean, in my yard, I'd have to dig up my neighbor's yard. I'd have to dig up everything around me for for a whole block to keep it out of my yard and to sift all that soil, it'd be impossible to do that. So sometimes you do have to use chem chemicals, but, um, and I think now I'm turning it back to you, Catherine, right? I forgot the IFIS assessment slides are next. Do you want to? Oh, okay. All right. All right. So there are legal departments, the Florida Department of Ag and Consumer Services and the Florida Wildlife and Conservation Commission they make the laws, um, the UF IFAS assessment and the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council that we've been talking about are not um, legal, but they do tell plants that are prohibited, which are legal, um, but they don't make those laws. They just give us the information so you can get advice and really good information from those sources, but the legal are those ones at the top. Um, UF IFAS assessment and non-native plants. Um, they are research-based, so that's one of the reasons we use those a lot and because it's um, part of the University of Florida and we, we know that they're accurate in their research. Um, sometimes we don't like some things they put on the list, but they're there for a reason. They put them on the list if um, they're showing to cause damage to the environment or in, any other um, humans or animals. Um, so any plant on the state or federal noxious weed list, they also include them. So that's good. So we know if it's um, prohibited, but there's also invasive, invasive no uses, high invasion risk, low invasion risk and caution and not a problem species. So they're continually evaluating plants and updating the list as needed. So every year you'll see new plants being added. Occasionally a plant will be taken off, but I think 
once it's on there, they've um, the research is showing that they don't become uninvasive over time. Um, these are the, the category, the zones in the state, north, central, and south. Sarasota County is actually completely in the central zone. Um, and, and the IFAS assessment lists pretty much follow north, central, and south lists by um, the, I think it's the hardiness zones of the state, but they go through there. And one of the easy ways to remember um, looking at a red light, the red light is stop, the prohibited invasive, invasive no uses and high invasion risk would all be on the red zone. Um, you want to not have those in your yard. You want to get rid of them if in there. In there, and I actually have a couple in my yard that I need to get out because they have been added to this high invasion risk. And then the cautionless or moderate risk would be the yellow. They will be reassessing those, and they may get added to the red list. But for now, they're they're only caution, and you just want to make sure you're you try not to plant any of those because they may be moved, but for now you can cautiously watch them in your yard. And then the green light, not a problem species plants, they're documented, but they have not become a species. They have not started spreading on their own or they're undocumented. They will reassess every 10 years, those plants, but, um, and they're constantly, they have not evaluated everything. And this, this one, um, the first time, when they first came out with this list and I started looking at these pictures, I said, what, that's not invasive, but these are the plants they have assessed. There's 847 plants that they've assessed and they've got a long way to go to assess other ones. But, um, so once you go to this list and now you can start spelling out a plant either common or, or um, Latin name, and usually it'll bring up suggestions. I, I looked up a plant yesterday that somebody had asked me about and I put the whole Latin name in there and then I started with a common name and it says it's not, um, they don't know it. But that just means they haven't assessed it yet. Um, but the plants they have assessed, you can look up by going to this part and finding it there or you can type it in there and, and find out if they have assessed it that way. Um, either one of those works. You can also go to this area here where it says filter results. And that brings up, um, you know, if you wanna just look in your, your zone of the state, if you just wanna look in North or you just wanna look in Central or South, if you only wanna find out the plants are prohibited, you can put that in there. There's a lot of different categories. And then you wanna just um, make sure that you hit, um, save those results and then um, click on it and then it'll bring up just those in the categories you se selected. Um, here's an example of an assessment. Um, the uh, oh, Tradescantia spathesia, um, oyster plant, <laughs> I couldn't think of that name. Um, it's invasive or invasive, no uses in the South, in the Central, it's not a problem species. Although we don't recommend it because there is a dwarf oyster plant, which is not um, considered invasive in any of the zones yet. And it's not a problem species in the North because it, it freezes, but that's two areas where um, that, that's good because having separated out by zones you're not hurting industry people in other areas where it's not even a problem. And that, that's that been one of the reasons why they've been able to get organizations like the Florida Nurseryman Growers Association to add plants to their list based on the, the category in the state. Um, some people say if it's invasive anywhere in the state, it shouldn't be allowed. But if it's not going to be a problem species in an area where it freezes, then we shouldn't worry about it. But that's just an example of one plant um, in that area. Um, okay, this is where you're going. <laughs> um, just let me just say something. Somebody said, are we sending a PDF of the slides? I don't think we can. I think it's way too big, but we are recording this and um, I will, um, once that gets out, I can send um, to everybody that was registered there. It was actually several people 
when I registered that had emails that it wouldn't go to. So if you didn't get the link to the resources this morning, send me an email and I will put my email in here. Don't give me information on the chat, just send me an email and then I can send you the, the link to the resources. Okay, Catherine. All right, yes, um, I would agree. There's a ton of information that we're sharing with you guys. And this is just one of our two hour sessions and we have many more coming up. So that really does indicate what an issue this is for our state. And we will provide you with lots of different links and resources so that you can explore the areas that you're most interested in on your own. Um, all right, so here are some other places to find Florida specific information. So of course your first place you're gonna go is that UF IFAS assessment, which Wilma just talked you through. And I put a link in the chat box and you will have a link in the email that Wilma sent you um, right before we got started as well. But here are some other places. Um, the Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants, uh, this particular link will take you right to the invasive plant laws, but the Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants also has plenty of information, especially on aquatic plants. And this is a University of Florida resource as well. And then if you're interested in the actual legal um, regulated noxious weeds in our state, uh, you will have a link that will take you to the Florida state listed noxious weeds. Um, and I believe we probably provided you the federal uh, list as well or a link to it. And then uh, the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council that we've already mentioned a couple times, every two years they put out a revised list and they do a category one and two. Wilma, if you go to the next slide, please. I think we have a picture of it. Yeah, so I know this is blurry. It's not intended for you to be able to read during the presentation, but this just gives you an idea. They give you a list of plants that are on category one. These are invasive exotics that are altering native plant communities by displacing native species, changing community structures or ecological functions or hybridizing with natives. Uh, this definition does not rely on the economic severity or geographic range of the problem, but on the documented ecological damage caused. So that's sort of how they categorize some of these species. So category one is the worst on this list. And they also do a zonation of north, central, and south as well. And then they have a category two, which are still invasives. Um, that have increased in abundance or frequency, but have not yet altered Florida plant communities to the extent shown by category one. But these are still also um, concerning invasive plants. Next. Uh, also, you can find information by going to your regional CISMA. So CISMA stands for Cooperative Invasive Species Management Areas. And you can see on the map here, they are regional. So um, anywhere from a couple counties to uh, five or six or seven counties in each of the CISMAs. If you're in Sarasota, Manatee, Pinellas, or Hillsboro, then you're in our CISMA, which is the Suncoast CISMA. Uh, which I co-chair along with Ray Vincent from Manatee County. And we provide educational offerings. Uh, when we're not in COVID, we do work days. And so there's opportunities to volunteer. We have a YouTube channel with videos on it. Uh, so please look into your regional uh, CISMA as well. Next. Um, edmaps.org, this is a wonderful website. Once again, this link will be in the resources that we sent you. Uh, what's really great about Edmaps is a lot of different species are in there, both plants and animals. So it can be a resource to help you identify invasive species. It also provides distribution maps. So if you wanna see what's in my county, um, are Burmese pythons in my county yet? You can take a look on this website and you know we have a map in the corner there, but when you're on the website, you can actually enlarge the map and it'll show you the specific counties in each of those states. You can also report sightings through EDMAP. So if you are concerned about an invasive species, either plant or animal, you can report it online through edmaps.org. You can report it by phone at 
or you can go to um, EdMaps and download the I've Got One app. And that's an app you can have on your cell phone where you can take photos and upload that. Um, that will go directly, I believe, to the FWC and they will make a decision about whether or not they need to come out and assess the situation. Next. So other ways that you can help is certainly by helping educate yourself and others about this situation and also learning how to identify and potentially report invasive species as we just talked about on the previous slide. Uh, a lot of our invasive species are traveling from backyards into natural areas and they're a problem in our backyard, but we certainly don't want them traveling into our natural areas where they are going to potentially shift the health of our overall ecosystems here in Florida. So uh, the more you learn how to identify, the more you talk to your family, friends, neighbors about invasive species, the more we get the word out. And so there's lots of great resources um, down in that bottom left-hand corner, that non-native plant book, which I have right in front of me because it's one of my favorite references. You can purchase this from the UF IFAS bookstore online, but you can also download it for free. And that link is um, in the resources we sent you. There's also a little handy guide. Oh, Wilma's got another book. I love that one as well. Um, non-native invasive plants of Southern Florida. She's holding that's, that stuff, or sorry, of Southern that. Forest. And that's one that you can also download for free from the resource link that I sent. And then in the middle picture there on the slide, invasive and non-native plants you should know. That's like a laminated fold-out guide that you can take out in the field with you. Um, and then there's also the cards that Wilma is holding up as well. And those are laminated, so they're really climate friendly if you want to go out into the field with them. And then, of course, our UF IFAS EDIS um, resource. EDIS stands for Electronic Delivery Document, sorry, Information Service, I believe. And those are some of the links I've been putting into the chat box when you've asked specific questions about carrot wood or Brazilian pepper tree. And so if you just Google UF EDIS, it'll get you to this website, which has tons of research and information directly from the researchers at University of Florida. It's not just for invasive species, it's for all sorts of things, gardening, agricultural, wildlife, nutrition. So it's an amazing resource that is available to all of us online. Next. And then uh, also following the Florida Friendly Landscaping uh, Program, which Wilma is the expert at our office in that. It's also what the Master, Master Gardener volunteers are trained in that manage our plant clinics and provide information to the public. This Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide is available for free at our office. We have a whole stack of them. You just walk in the front door and they're right there. You can come in and grab one, but it's also available to download for free. And we have given you that link in your resource document as well. But some of the things that you can do, of course, is to remove invasive plants from your own yard and replant with natives and or Florida friendly plants, things that we feel much less concerned about how they're gonna impact our environment. And also our native plants have evolved over time with our native wildlife and are providing the right type of habitat, whether that's food or a place to nest or cover. Our native plants are providing that wildlife habitat for our native animals. You wanna to try to shop at native plant nurseries and I think this links in your resource document, the fan.org link, Wilma, the Florida Association of Native Plant uh, Nurseries. I'm not if sure if it not, is or not. It's just fann.org. And that will um, be an association that provides you information about native plant nurseries near you if you're not sure where they are. You can join your local native plant society and then you're supporting a uh, native plant education throughout your area as well as getting an opportunity to do things with like-minded people. 
And always reach out to your local extension office, whether you're in Sarasota and you want to reach out to myself or Wilma or our horticulture staff, or if you're in a different area of Florida or even elsewhere in our country, there are extension offices in every state in our country. So they're going to be your go to source for research based information. And of course, as Wilma mentioned, we always recommend that we use chemicals as a last resort. So integrated management is when we're doing all those things Wilma talked about before we choose chemicals as a last resort. Next. So we really want to thank you. Um, before you leave, please take our survey. And once again, I'm Dr. Catherine Clements, co-chair of our Sunco SISMA and ecology and natural resources educator at our Sarasota County Extension. And there's Wilma in our Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. All right, well, thank you all for joining us.